Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you and praise you for your presence. We thank you and praise you for the power of your word and for this moment that you have impregnated with such powerful possibilities for healing and hope, renewal, revival, salvation, liberation, strength. We thank you and praise you for what you are up to, not only in the world around us, but yes, in our respective and individual lives. Thank you, O oh God, for being so kind as to order our steps and our stops to meet you in this majestic place of prayer, praise, and proclamation. And now, since you have arranged for us to meet you here and you are here, we need a word from you. We need to hear from you. If we don't hear from you, what shall we do? So please feel free to remove any distractions that may divert our attention. Don't let me or anything in me or about me get in the way of what you are up to and what you want to say and accomplish through me. Hide me behind your cross that we may see Jesus and we'll give you all glory and honor for you are our Father and Mother who art in heaven. Empty me of myself. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Take my mind and my mouth. Give me your word, give me wisdom, give me power that persuades, insight that informs, inspires, and instructs. Cover me with your grace, give power to your word, show us your glory, have your way, do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think according to the power at work within me. Now, speak to us in our respective context. May we hear from you, and having heard from you, may we leave out determined to make this world a better place. For we ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I am indeed peacock proud and honeymoon happy to be here at the great uh, Riverside Church. I remember almost 30 years ago, I was visiting a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Victor Hall, who was a student at Union Theological Seminary. And I made, of course, the trip or the trek over here to Riverside to take a tour. Of course, I'm a young preacher and I am blown away having familiarized myself with the history of this amazing congregation and phenomenal ministry. And while walking through here, I could not help but look up at this pulpit and dream of the day, a dream that would never come true. I would get to stand in the historic pulpit of Riverside Church. Well, that's over 30 years ago, and of course I left and said that will never ever happen in my life. And yet, here I am as a witness that dreams come true. It has everything to do not with my gifts, but with the fact that in this life, it's not so much what you know, but who you know. And I am pleased to know uh, the phenomenally gifted and brilliant uh, Minister Emeritus here at Riverside, Dr. James Forbes. Dr. James Forbes will go down as one of the truly great prophets of our time a homiletical genius and one of my homiletical heroes. And after hearing, hearing him introduce me, amen, we can do that. After hearing him introduce me in such an hyperbolic fashion, uh, I could not help but sit here in this amazing auditorium and pray for him uh, because of the fact that with all of his gospel greatness and grandeur, with his preaching prowess, uh, with his commitment as a man and minister of integrity, uh, he presented me and moved into the lane of hyperbole. He kept on and kept kept on and kept on. And so I began to pray that God would forgive him uh, for uh, all that he was saying about me that was so exaggerated to the point uh, that he began to lie. And then, uh, <laughs> And then I began to pray uh, that God would forgive me because I enjoyed the way the brother lied about me. So I thank God for the graciousness of Senior Minister Emeritus, 
Dr. James Forbes. He is as gracious as he is a genius of the gospel ministry. And so we are indeed indebted to him uh, for his kindness. And again, I am honored and humbled uh, to be here. He has already been kind enough to present uh, my phenomenal wife uh, who is here. I believe that when Maya Angelou sat, uh, when Maya Angelou wrote the poem, Phenomenal Woman, that she decided to use my wife uh, as the model uh, for that poem. And so I salute her uh, for who she is. Uh, she's put up with me for 27 years later this month and uh, then uh, she also has her own wonderful ministry of health and healing uh, and so I appreciate who she is and all that she does. So happy to see indeed the entire family. Thank you so much for your presence and for your kindness. I want to uh, in these moments share with you from a passage of scripture found in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and beginning at the 59th verse of the seventh chapter from the New Living Translation of the Greek New Testament. Hear now the living word. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that he died. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout persons came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. For these few moments, I'd like to share with you, with your prayers from the subject, when murder births a movement. When murder births a movement. This past week, during our Samuel DeWitt Proctor board retreat, I was inspired by the passion a father Michael Flager, as he spoke prophetically, no limit, lamented prophetically, of the throwaway mentality that often exists in this nation. Yes, with prophetic lament, Father Michael Flager spoke of the sad reality that in too many instances we put labels on individuals in order to place limitations on them, even justifying the elimination of them. I like that. We label in order to limit and eventually eliminate. Father Flago was referring to the fact that right there on the south side of Chicago, sadly, sinfully, and shamefully, lives are being lost because of America's addiction to guns and due to the sad reality that we are more caught up in the economy of the gun than we are the effect of the bullet. And with that being the case, Father Michael Flager dared to suggest when, with great prophetic passion that there are those those who are labeled throwaways in this country. Throwaways? Yes, throwaways. We see them in the labels that we place upon them. We've seen them in recent days along the border right there in the state of Texas where sadly individuals, children who are escaping, seeking somehow refuge in what Maya Angelou calls these yet to be United States of America and yet children are attacked as a Aliens. They are labeled as illegal in this nation of uh, refugees, this nation, as it were, of immigrants. Yes, my brothers and sisters, it is sad, sinful, and shameful that we label in order to limit. In that case, I cannot help but reflect upon the statement that was made uh, by Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, some days ago, said to be black and male is to be labeled a suspect in this nation. 
implication, of course, the veracity and sagacity of that statement opined by Oprah Winfrey manifest itself in so many ways. It manifest itself last year, about 13 months ago, when we received the verdict in the trial of George Zimmerman that ironically somehow became the trial of Trayvon Martin. And I could not help but be blown away when they were sharing during the trial a videotape of uh, George Zimmerman during his test of lying about the events of that February evening of 2012. I was blown away because George Zimmerman had the unmitigated gall over and over again as he went over the crime scene to share with the police what had happened on that evening from his perspective and he kept referring to Trayvon Martin as a suspect. I'll say it one more time. Oprah Winfrey said in this nation when you are black and male in many instances you are labeled a suspect and that's what George Zimmerman kept referring to Trayvon Martin as a suspect. Well I could not help but have an imaginary conversation with George Zimmerman because of course I understand why he would label Trayvon Martin the dangerous Trayvon Martin a suspect a suspect why because he was wearing a hoodie that night oh yeah it was raining he had to cover his head so he must have been a suspect because of the weaponry that he was carrying he was armed with skittles and iced tea he was a suspect minding his own business talking to his friend on the telephone and yet here is George Zimmerman labeling him a suspect sadly sinfully and shamefully we still live in a nation where my brothers and sisters persons are labeled in order to be limited and in many cases eliminated we profile in order to justify persecuting and then it was mind-blowing for me further when a few days later the president of the United States Barack Obama surprised the press corps by going into the press briefing room and then again this is the Friday after the verdict had taken place in the trial of George Zimmerman and President Bo Obama decides that he is going to transparently and thoughtfully testify open a window as it were to the experience of being black and male in the United States of America and do you recall what Barack Obama said as he testified that having having of having the experience of being profiled before he had become elect before he was elected senator in this nation he spoke of walking across the street and hearing doors to cars lock all of a sudden he spoke of walking through a department store and being followed because he is labeled a suspect Barack Obama spoke of getting on an elevator and watching helplessly as a woman would clutch her purse. Of course, Barack Obama was being quite gracious when he limited his profiling experiences to being before he was elected senator when there are those of us who testify that even since he's been president of the United States, he has been shamefully subjected to a profiling, but we won't spend much time on that because I want to take it a little bit deeper and say, Mr. President, as much as I appreciate your testimonial as it relates to what it means to be profiled in this country, profiling is deeper in the 21st century. It manifests itself in so many ways that find individuals incarcerated by injustice. And we see it manifest, do we not, when the poor are treated as political pinatas and those who find themselves misusing and abusing the poor for their own political agenda have the arrogant audacity to profile them as pathological and label them as lazy. Why? Because in a real sense we still label in order to limit, we still profile in order to justify persecuting. It happens when persons are locked out of opportunities and left behind and made to feel that they are the last and the least of these in this great nation.
condition, it happens, yes, to this day. And with that being the case, my brothers and sisters, I could not help but jump into this passage of scripture where we find the early church at its birth was victimized by a profiling. They were victimized by such a profiling that it eventuated in persecution. And in our text, we see a senseless murder, the murder of Stephen. We know by way of context that Deacon Stephen has been daring to speak prophetically truth to power and the sources of power in position all of a sudden discovered that you may be in position but if one dares to speak with integrity and courageously in the name of our great God all of a sudden you may be in position but the other person now has the power don't you appreciate the fact that Peter be, uh, that Stephen begins to exegete the history of the people of God and share with them God's operation in their history and as Stephen is doing that they cannot handle that they are upset with him because he is daring to uh, speak truth to power and again the ones in position no longer have the power but Stephen has the power that's history is it not because oftentimes those in position discover that there are others in power who may not have the position. You missed your shout, so I'll help you shout right quick. You do recognize my brothers and sisters that uh, it was Woodrow Wilson that had the position, but Ida B. Wales had the power. You do remember Abraham Lincoln, a vacillating president, had position, but Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe, they had the power. You do recognize my brothers and sisters that there was one George Wallace that had a position as governor of Alabama, but it was Martin Luther King Jr. that had the power. You do recognize that there are those who are in position, but then God raises up others who have the power. You still didn't get it. I've got to further shout you because Pharaoh had the position, but Moses had the power. You do recognize Saul had the position, but David had the power. Ahab and Jezebel had had position but Elijah had the power just because others have position it does not mean if you have prophetic integrity that God will not bless you with great power and so Stephen has power and now they are so upset with him that they stone him he is stoned he is now dead he has been murdered it is a senseless murder it is a tragic murder how sad it is and the Bible says things now go from bad to worse for the early church because all hell breaks out as it were. A great persecution is now the, what the church is victimized by. Why? Because if you are a part of the early church, you are labeled in order to justify being limited if not eliminated. And you see how they did it. They did it in so many ways. The text says that even Saul went from house to house dragging persons into prison. Why? Because you recognize that the criminal justice system and prisons have often been used as a tool of oppression in the hand of the oppressor. And so here is Paul misusing the criminal justice system and now persons are being dragged. Why? Because they've been labeled in order to justify being limited. They are profiled in order to be persecuted. I'm not coming through like I need to. James Baldwin can help us out right here because James Baldwin said, now as then we find ourselves uh, bound by the nature of our categorizations. I like that right there. But since you didn't get James Baldwin, I, I've got to give you Alice Walker. Alice Walker puts it this way. Alice Walker sagaciously suggested that in this nation, we are often imprisoned by the images that that have been imputed onto us. You still didn't shout. So I've got to give you Jay-Z. Jay-Z, would you help us out right quick? Jay-Z says, blindfolded, expected to walk a straight line, mind molded, taught to love you but hate mine. You didn't get Jay-Z. I got to give you Paul Lawrence Dunbar because Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, uh, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar spoke of a caged bird singing. I know why the caged bird sings. Ah, me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, he beat
beats his bars as he would be free. It is not a carol of joy nor a glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings. The caged birdification of individuals causes pain in the midst of persecution. That's what's happening in the text, but hold on. The text trumpets another truth, and that is when we wonder where is God in the face of senseless suffering? Where is God when murder happens because life is not valued as people are dehumanized? When we wonder where is God on the west coast of Africa as many individuals are enslaved in the Ebola crisis? Where is God as girls are going missing there on the west coast of Africa in Nigeria? Where is God there on the Gaza Strip as in the name of a military solution and protection we find civilians and children being killed senselessly where is God in the midst of all of this I've got good news for you I serve a God who is able to snatch good out of evil and when God does that God is able to take what was a senseless murder and transform it into a salvific movement you missed your shout that was good right there God can take God can take a senseless murder and transform it into a salvific movement. Has that not been the history? Yes, even in this nation, senseless murders have somehow birthed salvific movements. It was senseless in August of 1955 when Emmett Till was killed there and, and his body was found in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River in Mississippi. A senseless murder when his bloated and broken body was brought back to Chicago. His mother received the body and when the undertaker said do you want a closed casket funeral she said oh no I want an open casket funeral to expose the hypocrisy of the American practice of democracy and she was so inspirational in her courage that one Rosa Parks decided in December of that same year inspired by the courage of Mama Teal that she could take it no more and Rosa parks my brothers and sisters took a stand by remaining in her seat and that of course set loose 381 days of the Montgomery bus boycott you see it began as a murder but it became a movement you still didn't get that but you do recall 1963 1963, what a year it was, senseless murder on top of senseless murder as our nation was stunned by the assassination of Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi. We were stunned by the murder of one John Fitzgerald Kennedy. All of that in 1963. I'm not even done. It was the third Sunday in September of 1963 that four girls were studying Sunday school in 16th Street Baptist Church church in Birmingham, Alabama. A bomb went off. All of those are senseless murders, but it was through those senseless murders that somehow God brought something good out of that evil. And in 1964, 50 years ago, we found ourselves now celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Why? Because senseless murders can somehow give birth to salvific movements. I got to give you another one since you didn't shout on that one because you do know in 1964 we lost Swerner, Goodman and Cheney during Freedom Summer in Mississippi senselessly murdered 1965 Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed trying to register to vote there in Selma, Alabama there was the march from Selma to Montgomery that took place causing one Lyndon Johnson to say we shall overcome and in August of 1965 49 years ago he signed into passage the Voting Rights Act. Why? Because it began as a senseless murder but it became a salvific movement. Well I got one more to give you and that is you do recognize that we are here today as a part of a salvific movement because of one more senseless murder. It took place on what we now call Good Friday and there on Good Friday the Bible says that Jesus died for us, wounded for 
our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities with his stripes we are healed he was senselessly killed but we are now a part of a salvific movement because of what took place on Calvary's cross and that's the good news that's the good news of hope and healing I have for us today and I have for this nation yes even our world and that is the blood of those who have gone before us cries out from the ground to not let their deaths be in vain but to rise up instead and ignite a movement that will indeed make a difference that is why God has left us here I, their death should inspire our lives to make a difference in this world well how does that work I'm glad you asked it works and I love the text because the text says that the moment that persecution broke out they went everywhere preaching the word you missed your shout I've got to give it to you in chapter 8 verse 1 I am blown away by the fact it says that persecution broke out and they went to Judea and Samaria preaching the gospel I got to give it to you because you didn't shout yet here here it comes the Bible Bible says in chapter 1 verse 8 of the same book of Acts that Jesus before boarding a cloud and going back to eternity Jesus told his disciples listen you're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and all over this world but from chapter 1 verse 8 to the end of chapter 7 they are stuck like Chuck in Jerusalem instead of going all over the world and fulfilling the call and commission that Christ had given them they are stuck right there in Jerusalem going nowhere it's their comfort zone as it were my late mentor Emmanuel Scott senior said life's greatest tragedy is to already be where you are going that's real good you may want to tweet that right quick life's greatest tragedy is to already be where you're going they were where they were going until persecution broke out and when persecution broke out they went everywhere preaching the gospel but when persecution broke out, they went everywhere. In a real sense, a murder gave birth to a marvelous movement, a movement that went the world over, a movement that in a real sense was about transforming and making the world a better place. But it began in persecution. Well, knowing I'm at Riverside, I had to do my homework. And so etymologically, I unpacked the word. Watch this persecution. The word persecution in the Greek New Testament is amazing because the word persecution, we get our word press from it. Press, P-R-E-S-S. -S. That's the word we get from the Greek word that means persecution in our text. Here's what shouts you. And that is the word press is used in so many wonderful ways that help us to see maybe what God is up to in the 21st century during these tumultuous and even tragic days the word press I like that because you see the word press do you not when it comes to basketball when a basketball game is being played and the and, 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 and a team is losing they put on a full court press the full court press basically says that the game is about to be won by the op opponent and so we've got to throw everything at you because of the fact that the game is going in a way that we do not want it to go and so a full court press ensues here it comes if you find yourself experiencing a, a lot of pressure these days you may, you may want to keep in mind in a full court press they only put pressure on the one that has the basketball so evidently you have the ball because of all that you were up against and dealing with well that didn't get you I got to give you another one you see whenever you have what a bottle of, uh, of, of chloroseptic for example and your throat is sore how do you get out of the bottle what's in the bottle what's in the bottle can heal you and give you strength well it has to be the nozzle has to be pressed why because oftentimes in life for God to get out of us what is in us there must be pressure applied I'm still not coming through I got you now here it is this morning 
this morning I'm getting ready to go and so I had to uh, look at my clothes and my clothes were wrinkled well I could not come to Riverside Church with wrinkled clothes and you know what I did I, I had to press my clothes well I took out the iron and the ironing board and after plugging it in I then put my shirt up on the board and check out what happened the shirt looked up at me from the ironing board and the shirt said Freddie I don't believe you were about to put that hot iron on me I said first of all shirt you're not talking to me shirt said yes I am talking to you I said no you're not talking I'm talking to a shirt a shirt and I'm thinking maybe I'm going to Riverside and I'm hallucinating and that's why I'm tripping right now but the shirt said oh no you're not tripping Shakespeare said there are sermons in stones and Jesus said if these hold their peace the rocks will cry out so if rocks can rejoice and sermons come from stones you're about to speak with the shirt I said all right shirt let's have a conversation why are you tripping the shirt said because you're about to burn me with that hot iron I said oh no no I'm not going to burn you I would not dare do anything like that the shirt said but you see the steam coming out of that iron of course I see the steam well why would you put that on me I'm putting that on you not to burn you because I paid for you I would not burn you I bought you I paid for you you belong to me and if I burn you it's going to make me look bad so I'm not going to burn you I paid for you you are mine and because you are mine I treasure you and the shirt said okay I trust you then go ahead do what you're going to do I then put that iron on the shirt and began to go back and forth and the shirt said that's kind of hot right there how do you know I can handle it I said because I know what you're made of and so as a consequence of knowing what you are made of I, I have the appropriate nozzle setting on the iron and by now the shirt is feeling a little bit better but the shirt said Freddie I got one more question for you and that is how long are you going to keep this iron on me I said until I get your wrinkles out well I am simply trying to let you know even though there may be some weaknesses in the metaphor but there is a God that sits high and looks low and God says even though you may find yourself under the heat of pressure this day and suffering I've got some good news I'm not going to burn you because I paid for you I'm not going to burn you because you belong to me I'm not going to burn you I'm just determined to get your wrinkles out so go ahead and let God get your wrinkles out count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials and tribulations knowing the trying of your faith is working patience Freddie Haynes remix the trying of your faith Faith is getting your wrinkles out and so God has a way of using the pressure that is upon us in order to push us into a difference that we would not have made had we not been under pressure I'm almost done but I'm feeling kind of good right now because the text says something else and that is the text lets us know that in this life it takes prophetic courage to take a stand against the forces of evil and injustice and that's what happened do you see the text the text says that devout individuals then took the broken body of Stephen and gave Stephen a, a dignified burial you do recognize that in that time in biblical antiquity whenever one was convicted and then sentenced to death as a felon that they as a part of their punishment their remains were to remain right there on the ground and if anyone was to violate that and give them a, a dignified burial they were subject to the same punishment as the convicted felon that had been stoned do you know what they did they engaged in civil disobedience against an unjust system and maybe that's what God is calling us to do in the 21st century the 49th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act as a Supreme Court decided to gut it last year maybe that's what God is calling us to do as we see the senseless death of persons like Eric Garner right here in New York and even last night in St. Louis one Michael Brown is shot down I'm trying to say maybe there's a need to rise up in righteous indignation with prophetic courage and engage in the type of civil disobedience that refuses to go along with injustice that is our heritage that is our faith
that's our faith and that's our heritage and and that simply means that every now and then we get called names I like that they called dr. Martin Luther King jr. an outside agitator when he went to Birmingham Alabama to lead the Birmingham movement that was a compliment and they did not even know it they called him an outside agitator you know what an agitator is I looked that up that, that that's what's on a uh, washing machine and whenever your clothes are real dirty and the stain is real deep the detergent is not enough they must have some agitation because the agitation says I'm going to remove the stain from the fabric and every now and then we need to engage in prophetic agitation and make a difference in this world let's engage in prophetic agitation so that the widening wealth gap between the have gots and have nots begins to come to an end let's engage in prophetic agitation so this nation will come to discover that military weaponry is never a solution in our our world's conflicts let's engage in agitation so every child regardless of their tax based district experiences a quality education let's engage in agitation until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream let's engage in agitation until everyone is protected under the law so no matter who you love you can still experience Experience the equality of marriage I'm trying to say we have a responsibility to engage in prophetic agitation well I gotta quit I've given you too much but I got to give you one more in the final analysis watch the text the text says that somehow some way God is able to take what began as tragically negative and transform it into something that is transformationally positive the Bible says they went everywhere preaching the good news and I'm glad they went everywhere preaching the good news because they went everywhere even even under the threat of persecution and when you do that you recognize that somehow God is still in control is that not what James Russell Lowell meant when he said truth forever on the scaffold wrong forever on the throne yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadows keeping watch above his own they went everywhere preaching the good news because what was a senseless murder somehow was trained transformed into a salvific movement and when you go everywhere transforming this world with the liberating good news of Jesus Christ you go knowing you're not going by yourself but that you've got a God that sits high and looks low and God will be with you and somehow what began as a tragic murder can become a transformational movement I close with this I never will forget reading about my one, one of my favorite favorite sheroes of all time Harriet Tubman Harriet Tubman amazed me because Harriet Tubman she escaped from slavery in the south up to freedom in the north but after she escaped she did something mind-blowing she went back and she went back a whole lot of times to rescue individuals who were stuck in slavery now here's what's mind-blowing and that is now you have scholars who are debating how many times Harriet went back I really could care less how many times she went back the fact is she went back because that's what it means to know God for yourself and that is when God blesses you you go back and help the rest when God does something for you you allow God to do something through you Harriet went back and she went back over and over again and when she went back I'm not even done Harriet then during the Civil War became a spy for the Union Army is that not mine oh, I know why you're not shouting because you forgot about the fact that this is Harriet Tubman Harriet Tubman as a teenager got between a runaway slave and an overseer the overseer hurls a piece of iron in the direction of the runaway it hits Harriet in the head and she passes out and for the rest of her life Harriet would pass out inexplicably and unexpectedly she could not get health care because she had a pre-existing condition <laughs> and so Harriet Tubman 
Harriet Tubman would pass out unexpectedly, inexplicably, she would just pass out. That meant that when she was leading expeditions of emancipation from the south up north, that all of a sudden she would pass out. There's one picture in a book of Harriet, a drawing I should say, of Harriet having passed out and those runaway slaves have surrounded her. And there's a poster, a wanted poster of Harriet Tubman, dead or alive. Harriet Tubman served as a spy during the Civil War, but she never got caught and she never lost a passenger on the Underground Railroad. And if you are like me, you must have asked the question, how, Harriet, were you able to survive and never get caught while you were passing out unexpectedly and inexplicably? And so since you asked that question, I talked with Harriet. You see, I have a talk with a shirt earlier, and now I'm talking with Harriet up in eternity. I said, Harriet, would you please tell us so I can tell Riverside church how is it that you never got caught and you never lost a passenger even though you would pass out unexpectedly and inexplicably and Harriet said well Freddie make sure you tell Riverside Church I never got caught because as long as I was conscious I was working for God knowing when I was unconscious that God was working for me and I'm here to let you know God will work for you. God will make a way for you. God will take care of you and we shall overcome.